a notorious prison, lies smack in the heart of Kuala Lumpur. Guru Jail was a time bomb when I was there. Once home to killers, rapists, and heroes. The prisoner only loses his right of uh, freedom of movement. In all of the team, he's battle. To some, it was sacred. Does it tell him? To others, it was hell. Enter the realm of lost souls. Beyond bars, Pudu Jail. Kuala Lumpur is a city that likes to look forward to the future. But in June 2010, more than a thousand people gather in central Kuala Lumpur to protest against the demolition of a hundred-year-old city landmark. Their cause is not palace nor temple, but the dark and forbidding Pudu Jail. I still don't know that stories behind these walls. So I guess the only way for us to appreciate these stories is by taking care of this building. Don't demolish it. You know, we should take care of it, like, take it like a heritage building. And I guess the future generation could learn a lot more. Pada saya tak perlu dirobohkan kerana di Kuala Lumpur ni kita kekurangan kita kekurangan bangunan bersejarah. Everybody was waiting because the excavators were there. The big machines were about to knock down the wall. And when it did, there was this big gasp from everyone. For others, the old dilapidated jail no longer has a place in the center of this vibrant, prosperous city. As a pro Malaysian, I don't know how a prison represents my heritage and culture. The less the prison is, the more my people are safe. Gangster Tan Alek spent five years locked up behind these looming walls before going straight. For him, Pudu is a concrete symbol of redemption and should be preserved to warn future generations that crime doesn't pay. <laughs> Former prison officer Nur Shahid believes just as strongly that the infamous jail must be saved. It is a heritage building. It was built 115 years ago. So I think that part of it should be preserved just to remind people that Udu Jail wants to hear. You see, that is important for future generations to see. Pudu Prison has been an integral part of the history of Kuala Lumpur for more than a hundred years. A big bustling city today, Kuala Lumpur started as a collection of humble dwellings at the confluence of two rivers. Here, thousands of impoverished Chinese men struggled to make their fortunes in muddy, disease-ridden jungle swamps. Then, Kuala Lumpur was a frontier town, a lawless place, where rival gangs fought each other to gain control of gambling dens. When they died, the inhabitants of old Kuala Lumpur, including the victims of these vicious gang wars, ended up in vast burial grounds built on the edge of town. It was on top of one of these burial grounds that the British resolved to build a mighty prison to impose their will on the lawless gangs. It was built 115 years ago in a jungle. Pudu was a jungle at that time, you see? And Kuala Lumpur was Batu Road. So, they said that tigers were roaming around there in those days, you see, it was 100 over years ago. Construction began in 1891 using materials brought from all over the British Empire. After four years of hard convict labor, Pudu Jail loomed above the swampy ground of the old cemetery. Look at me, Pudu Jail. I'm a statement building too, you know. If you do something bad, boy, you, you, you're just gonna go behind there, you know. 
Whoever is in power makes statement buildings. Look at, look at the KLCC, you know, the Twin Towers. You look at Shanghai, you look at any country in the world. At any period of time, there are statement buildings. Pudu became a brooding symbol of British power and its harsh system of justice. Death stalked the new prison from the very start. In August 1895, an outbreak of cholera sweeps through the jail. Pudu was quarantined. Prisoners languished in the cells, their bodies ravaged by lethal bacteria. The epidemic seemed unstoppable. Hundreds died horribly. The prison governor had to find the source of infection. It was the prison surgeon, E.A.O. Travers, who eventually worked out why Pudu had become a death trap for its inmates. Travers realized that the solution must have something to do with the prison's water supply. So he traced it back to its source, an old well that tapped straight into the old Chinese cemetery beneath the prison. It brimmed with deadly bacteria. But it still took three years to stem the outbreak. And it seems that the restless dead have never let the residents of Pudu Jail, neither prisoners nor warders, forget their presence. I heard the story of a female flying ghosts going around, you see, from cell, looking at that and all that at night. Since it was built, thousands of prisoners have been incarcerated inside Pudu Prison. They had committed every imaginable kind of crime. But for every prisoner, each day began with the same ominous sound as their cell doors are unlocked. For more than a century, Malaysia's most wanted wrongdoers were locked up in Pudu Jail in the center of Kuala Lumpur. Inside, Every inmate was treated equally. The prison made no distinction between races and classes. There is no special classification according to uh, crimes here in Pudu Jail. All prisoners that come from Selangor are housed here, whether they are robbers or murderers or rapists or kidnappers, they are all put in Pudu Jail. For the prisoners and warders alike, the day began before dawn. Outside, traders at the nearby wet market have long been awake. School children and the first wave of workers were starting another normal day. Only the fetid smells wafting from the prison canteen reminded ordinary citizens of a very different world hidden behind the concrete walls of Pudu Jail. Inside, prison life had its own unique rhythm. It began noisily at 7 o'clock with the cacophonous sound of 600 padlocks being unlocked and cell doors thrown open. Every warder on duty was responsible for maintaining order on a single wing of 50 cells, each one containing at least six prisoners. Mula-mula dari pukul tujuh tu, dia orang buka bidik, buka bidik dia orang buang najis. Najis dia orang punya najis lah, satu dulu pakai, tong pakai ni apa kan. Ada yang buat tukang kasut, ada yang buat ini tukang kayu, ada yang buat tukang jahit. Inside this pressure cooker world, fights exploded frequently, usually without warning. For inmates, fighting was a matter of honor, and sides had to be taken. Life was cheap. Grudges were never forgiven. Yang mode, I have say we should leave. Yes, 
，好，阿贪唔落就咩咯，就打交咯。你免不了嘅。如果系爱嘅，即系如果系心唔服嚟讲，即系下昼嗰条你你入嚟我房咯。Many of the inmates were hard-bitten gangsters and triad gang members. They had no intention of making peace with old enemies who had also ended up inside Pudu. Many of the bloody fights that erupted between prisoners were unfinished gang wars. Even for prisoners unconnected to gangs inside or outside the jail, violence was hard to escape. Just about anything could be turned to use as a weapon. Zaman dulu dulu, tang zaman zaman saya dulu lah. Kalau beraduh, memang ada lah kan. Memang dia kalau beraduh ni, beraduh main tikam tikam lah. Main pasal dia banyak game fight. Pasal dia banyak kumpulan kumpulan. Ela satu bilik pun mau lima enam belas orang. Satu bilik tu enam belas orang sekali turun datang, tak mati yang seorang tu. Mati lah kelentak. Yang pakai buji, yang pakai apa macam 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 lah. Yang pakai batu batu macam ada. For some prisoners who have been pushed to the limit, there was only one final way out. Even a toughened career criminal like Tana Lek succumbed to despair. The prison authorities could not predict when an inmate might crack. Warder Abdul Manap spent 30 years working in Pudu. He remembers one incident when a prisoner working as a cobbler in the prison workshop unexpectedly went berserk. Faced with violent daily confrontations, the warders had one final sanction, the solitary confinement cell. Prisoners called a spell of solitary confinement going to Genting Highlands, referring to a hill resort just outside Kuala Lumpur. But of course, it was no holiday. The solitary confinement cell was tiny, dark and putrid. Time locked away in here could undermine the mental state of even the hardest men. Prisoners condemned to solitary confinement received only bread and water, which was torture for Asian men used to daily portions of rice. Only the toughest of the tough, the Pudu elite, could hope to withstand this sanity-sapping regime. Whenever they could, Pudu inmates pursued their criminal careers as they did outside, even secretly making weapons inside the prison. When you're inside, desperation is the mother of invention. 
and Pudu prisoners had plenty of time to dream up new ideas. Longing for a taste of something sweeter than the daily rations of rice or bread, some even worked out a way of baking delicious cakes. Cangkek pisang, cangkek nas, cangkek apa semua dah biasa lah. Ni kita pergi ke kek sekali-sekali time hari cuti special for hours lah. Jadi time dapat hari perjumpaan tu, dapatlah Milo. Jadi Milo, gula, jadi ada kelebihan lah sikit. Ha, jadi masa tu lah kita gunakan kelebihan tu. Roti kita simpan sebelum nak mula, kita kena jemur dulu. Apabila pagi dapat roti ration, pagi kan, pagi dapat, kita kumpul dulu. Kompol petang agak agak tunggu masuk-masuk bilik baru kita uli dia. Dia dah kering sikit. Apabila dah kering senang. Ha, dia dah kering kita game buat gini. Jadi okeylah sampai dia dah betul-betul dah kering jadi jadi tepung boleh. The prison chefs used simple apparatus found in every cell plus some help from mother nature. Tahu plastik tu kat gayung tu panjang tadi, tahu roti tu semua uli dia. Jadi dia dah tentu kita angkat plastik tu cantik. Jadi dia letak kat tinggi sikit. Atas angin lembu angin. Letak atas. Letak dengan pasir plastik tu sendiri. Tak ada semut, tak ada apa kan. Letak air dia tu. Jadi angin dia kena dia keras. Tapi bila dia keras, dia dah jadi macam biskut. Dan kita potong cantik, rangok. Officially, the prisoner's day ended at 10 o'clock when the warders locked up the inmates in their cells for the night. To add spice to such tedious daily routines, some warders competed to see who could get the job done quickest. The record time was five minutes for 50 cells. As night fell over Kuala Lumpur and Pudu Jail, people rushed home or crammed into cafes and restaurants. Life didn't stop inside Pudu either. Night was the time to make secret deals. It was called the hour of the shooters. Kita buat satu macam sumpit tu. Ah macam sumpit kita tahu lah barang-barang apa yang kita tahu ketah ke tahu apa ke. Kadang-kadang kadang kita rabuk juga lah. Sementara tu sambil nyelam minum air dah guna ni. Ada yang pakai tali, yang sambung tadi lah bila kalau tak sampai kita boleh tarik balik tali tu balik. Ha boleh tarik balik tadi, kita tembak ke sekali. kadang-kadang kita kalau tak sampai juga kita panggil yang beli depan pula, pancing depan pula. Pancing main pas-pas lah. Sana ke sana, sana ke sana. For many prisoners, as the cell door slammed shut and night fell, there were tantalizing reminders of a life outside. Dia punya ke siapa? Dia punya yang ya, ya, mana tu kering-kering-kering ni tu. Kering jauh hong tu lah. Mana tu mana tu kering ni. Eh, mana tu kering ni. Mana tu mana. Ini kering si dia lah <laughs> for prisoners like Tan, there was always hope for a better life once they had served their time inside. But there were others who never left Pudu Jail alive. These were the prisoners on death row, awaiting their appointment with the Pudu Hangman. Pudu Prison, in the heart of Kuala Lumpur, hidden away inside the prison, is death row. Empty today, these were once the cells of the damned. One of the most infamous death row inmates was Botok Chin. A born rebel, Chin was impatient to get it over with. Dengan itu jam gantung hukum itu jangan gantung. Mana gantung? Pui lama gantung. Baru jadi. Sampai disiram pakcik dengan air kencing. Ha? <laughs> botak cin. Ha, syat betul botak cin. Dia marah pakcik tak boleh jadi first man lah. Ha, dia pasal dia marah tu lah. Botak cin played the hard man all his life. But when he was finally led into the execution chamber, he flinched. Mana botak cin ada steady. Kong. Naik, naik pergi gantung pun. The death row prisoners dreaded Thursday mornings. That was when an officer read out the list of prisoners to be executed the next day. Mereka hanya mula gelisah pada hari Rabu. Kita tahu kenapa? Sebab hari Khamis adalah hari pengistiharan hukuman akan dibaca. Artinya kalau hari Khamis itu ada panggilan, 
bererti panggilan itu untuk menentukan yang akan digantung pada hari Jumaat. Normally, three hangings were scheduled to take place every Friday. Those who did not make it onto the dreaded Thursday list had another week to live. Abdul Rashid was Pudu's religious counselor. His task was to prepare inmates for the end. Kalau dia kalah, dia masih boleh gantung. Pudu lah. Uh, jadi selama saya duduk dalam penjara tu, saya dah tengok 30 lebih lah. Uh, Mula-mula dia gantung 3-3, lepas tu dia gantung tu dah ketak, dia bagi 2-2-2 sampai 94. Pasak kali lah. The relentless toll of executions filled other prisoners with dread. Prisoners on death row dealt with their fate in different ways. Some were resigned, but others had to be dragged screaming into the execution chamber. Or in the case of communist prisoners, singing. Many of these showed their defiance to the end, striking up the red flag as warders marched them to the execution chamber. I remember when we hang the uh, two condemned prisoners who shot the chief police officer. He went out singing. It was a sound familiar to other prisoners. When Malaysia was gripped by communist insurgencies in the 1980s, singing was often heard on Pudu's death row. Put a nose around his neck, he was still singing, and he went down singing. So I think that singing gives him the courage. For Councillor Abdul Rashid, consoling death row prisoners was always traumatic. Saya pada hari pertama, pada pengalaman pertama aku menggantung. Pada 17, 18, 72. Malam subuh tu gantung dan malam berikut tu memang saya boleh tidur saya nampak tali. Tali gantung depan saya. Many death row inmates had to wait months or even years for their sentence to be carried out. Waiting was a kind of torture. Dia lagi reda dia ingat dia orang ni kalau boleh itu janjat tu hukum tu jangan tu. Dia lagi senang dia tak tunggu tu dia punya menderitaan tu. Macam nak nak nunggu tu kita nak menggantungkan Dah nunggu sama bertahun-tahun pula. Duduk pula dah dalam bilik aja. Menunggu ni satu penyiksaan. So, kalau dah laksan hukuman pada dia, itu adalah lebih baik pada dia daripada menunggu berminggu-minggu, berbulan-bulan, bertahun-tahun. Dan ini menyiksaan dia. Chins. They had to be a special breed properly carry out the rituals of the death chamber. Whenever a hanging was scheduled, a pungent odor heralded the arrival of the executioner. Sebelum pelaksanaan itu dilakukan, biasanya memang adalah beberapa tanda. Misalnya bau kapur barus. Itu pun tidak semua orang cium. Misalnya pegawai yang berjaga malam, tercium ada semacam bau kapur barus. Itu kapur barus. Biasa digunakan untuk mandi kamayan. Pudu's executioners were handpicked and had to complete a rigorous training program in Glasgow, Scotland. In the world of the Pudu prison, they were the ultimate professionals. Warders who served longest on death row came to regard it as just another job. Yeah, pasti kalau masa hukum gantung tu pasti ada jaga situ. 
ah uh, pasti sampailah gantung tu tolong ni orang ni orang orang yang suka gantung ni dia pukul pukul dam dah, dah sampailah dah sampai dia nak nak gantung orang tu kan belakang nak pasang gari orang tu kadang tu ada yang melawan the apparatus used in the death chamber was also inherited from the british nooses were hand woven in england a noose was good only for three executions then it was discarded the best hangmen prided themselves on getting the job done quickly. Gantung, gantung dia tadi itu ada besi yang ada besi tembaga je kan. Dia gantung sarung cerat begitu. Itu dia buka ni macam ni terbuka dia kan. Orang-orang begini ha. Belakang benda tu terbuka dia kan. Po gitu. Ada gear tu. The most expert executioners could extinguish a life in just 10 seconds. Abang tu pun tu bukalah apa dia kan kepada tu buka. Ah tu dia kau pencung ke kanan tu. Kalau orang tak biasa terperanjat. Dia buka tu dia bunyi tau. Huh! Angin tu. Angin tu keluar. Oh, dia kena kena tu buka ni. Tabak. The terrible sound of Pudu's death machine reminded prisoners listening from other wings of the ultimate punishment. Among former inmates of Pudu Jail, there is a special elite, a tiny handful of former death row inmates who escaped the hangman's brass-ringed noose. One is Bangkok. In 1984, he was sentenced to death for drug trafficking. Awak ni kap eh uh, hari nanti dia tadi awak akan dibawa ke satu tempat. Di situ awak akan menjalani kemahangan gantung sebab nanti. Ha di situ baru kita rasalah. Kita terasalah dia sejuk ke kepanasan dia baru kita rasa dalam dia, dalam mahkamah tinggi itu. Week after week, month after month, Bangkok listened to the death machine at work and wondered when his turn to meet the hang would come. Death seemed inevitable, but in Malaysia, the king can grant pardons to some prisoners, and Bangkok was lucky, very lucky. Now he's serving out a life sentence in another jail. Both prisoners and their warders avoided discussing death row. It was a forgotten, secretive world. But it was the desperate actions of a death row inmate called Jimmy Chua that would remind the Malaysian public of the existence of Pudu's death row and set in motion the decline and fall of the old prison. The long, hot summer of 1986, Pudu was a human pressure cooker about to explode. Pudu jail was a time bomb when I was there in 1978 to 1981. It was very crowded. Imagine the prison was built for 600 prisoners, but at that time we had more than 5,000 prisoners. Cells designed for one man are crammed with 10 or more prisoners. Every warder must oversee at least 300 men. It was a catastrophe waiting to happen. Thousands of prisoners, many of them hardcore criminals, squashed in appalling conditions with time on their hands and little oversight. Inevitably, the pressure cooker burst. The crisis began when death row inmate Jimmy Chua hatched a plan to break out of the hellhole of Pudu Jail. On Monday, October 17, 1986, Chua and five other prisoners seized prison doctor Radzi Jafar and Abdul Aziz, a medical assistant in the prison infirmary. Chua demanded that the prison authorities release him and his gang and the hostages go free. The kidnappers wanted access to a helicopter to fly them to freedom. But the prison governor rejected their demands. As director general, I will never let them go out. I'm going to kill them. I'll shoot them in the car. Pudu Jail was now in lockdown. They had a capsule with me. They had to go out. 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 So they had to go out. They had to go out. One long-term inmate knew that Chua had no chance of getting out. 
，咁黃蘇馬都係係嘅，保安都做到好咩咗嘅。The atmosphere inside the besieged infirmary was explosive. By now, plans to use special forces, the UTK, to break the siege were well advanced. They would go in fighting, but then Prime Minister Dr. Mahathir Mohamad was briefed about the plan to end the siege. It was the biggest news story in Malaysia. Mahathir feared the political fallout if there was bloodshed. Uh, Dr. Mahathir was a bit concerned about the solutions. I think his word was, if it can be avoided, let there be no bloodshed. After getting new orders to show restraint, the plans changed, and so did the weapons. By getting them, getting them a rotten stick, the big one, you know. But how would the UTK unit get inside the infirmary without using violence? It was the prison governor, Dato Ibrahim, who found a solution. He had begun secret negotiations with one of Chua's gang, who promised to let the authorities know when the criminal kingpin's guard was down. Then, on day six of the siege, Ibrahim received a dramatic call from the infirmary. Those this chap said, Dato, you, you come now. I will open the gate. The UTK men burst through the unlocked door into the infirmary and took down Chua's gang with their canes. After 140 hours under siege, Dr. Rodzi and Abdul Aziz were released unharmed. For the authorities, the end of the siege was a great success. Chua and his men were disarmed without bloodshed. Under pressure from the Prime Minister, the authorities began to improve conditions inside Pudu Jail. But ringleader Jimmy Chua had little time to appreciate the new improved Pudu. He was returned to death row and hung, the 108th inmate to die on the gallows inside Pudu prison. In the aftermath of the hostage crisis, there was intense debate about the future of the old jail. When the dust settled, it was clear that Pudu's days as a working prison were numbered. The Malaysian authorities focused their resources on modern, up-to-date prisons. Today, the brooding concrete slab of Pudu stands forlorn and empty. Its only inmates now are, some say, the spirits of prisoners long dead. Menurut kepercayaan orang Melayu, rumah yang dibiar kosong selama 40 hari akan didiami forever. Kita akan masuk dalam 2 jam. Pertama kita buat kajian di uh, lorong. Lepas tu di sel uh, sel 111 yang dikatakan sangat keras. Abdullah and his team will leave nothing to chance and have brought all kinds of high-tech ghost monitoring equipment. Uh, semua pengkaji paranormal seluruh dunia ada beberapa peralatan uh, utama untuk mengkaji paranormal. Yang pertama, video kamera. Yang kedua, kamera. Sebab baiknya digital. Ketiga, IR thermometer, infrared, iaitu merakam suhu. Keempat, EMF. Kelima, sensor. A large mirror is also essential because some spirits only manifest as reflections. Abdullah begins by leading his team into the long central block of the old jail, the trunk of the spread eagled man. Here his assistant, Siti, will be left to monitor any spooky happenings. Candles are set along the walls to register any atmospheric disturbances that might suggest a ghostly presence. A video camera will record anything out of the ordinary. Abdullah leads the rest of his team to cell 111, chosen tonight because some Chinese believe that 111 symbolizes the three joysticks that are lit for the dead. The ominous reputation of cell 111 may be deserved. A warder once committed suicide in here. Abdullah sets up a camera and the spirit mirror and leaves another fearless assistant to wait for results. Abdullah is reminded that during the war, the Japanese beheaded British prisoners of war inside Pudu. 
Perhaps their headless spirits will appear tonight, or perhaps not. Tadi kamera apa masalah? Tak tahu lah. Bateri semua penuh, tapi dia terpadam. Dan sebelum terpadam tu dia berbunyi dulu lah. Abdullah's last stakeout will be on Pudu's death row. Over the years, hundreds of men have waited here for their last appointment with Pudu's hangman. Gelombang dalam ni sangat negatif. Perasaan kecewa, kesal, taubat. Kalau anda dalam bilik ini sendiri, barulah anda dapat rasakan apa yang saya rasakan sekarang ni. The paranormal team is fascinated by the last gruesome moments of one female communist in the 1950s. Her death inspired one of the enduring ghost stories of Pudu. Sentenced to be hanged, she had tried to commit suicide by cutting her throat, but failed. Then the hangman came calling. The force of the drop wrenched off her head. Many have cited her headless ghost among the pantheon of spirits and specters that allegedly haunt Pudu. At three o'clock in the morning, Abdullah and his team decide to leave Pudu and return to the world of the living. It would seem at first that he has failed in his quest, but then Abdullah begins examining the video footage from the main block. Behind his assistant's back, the candles can be clearly seen to quiver as if some sort of presence was passing by. Abdullah is convinced that something supernatural disturbed those candles. Most people will need much more convincing evidence. Whatever the truth about Pudu's supernatural inmates, one thing is for sure. The prison remains a haunting presence in modern Kuala Lumpur. Although partly demolished, Pudu bitterly divides opinion. It would seem that a city that so fervently embraces the future is not quite ready to forget this symbol of its past. Today, Pudu Jail stands derelict and empty in downtown Kuala Lumpur, a brooding relic of the past, surrounded by gleaming skyscrapers. The old prison has some surprising admirers. 20 years ago, on a hot afternoon in July 1989, Tan Alek left Pudu Jail for the last time, a free man. During his years inside, he had often wished that Pudu would crumble to dust. But today, he is supporting a campaign to preserve the prison as a monument to redemption, including his own. The old Victorian idea behind Pudu Prison was not just to punish, but to make its inmates better men. And that is what Governor Dato Ibrahim struggled to do, sometimes using unconventional methods, like mural painting, when I visited the Penang prison, I saw this uh, mural painting being done inside one of the workshop wall there. So I think it's a good painting. So I asked who, who is the painter, he said, the one prisoner. He used only his fingers to paint all this. His fingers, so I was surprised. For a year, Kong Yun Chong labored on his mural painted along 394 meters of the prison's exterior walls. Even when he was released, Kong returned to Pudu to complete his masterwork as a free man. Kong and his team used up more than 2,000 liters of paint to create an astonishing work of art. The mural made Pudu prison unique. But he was happy and he finished the whole job for me. So I thank him very much for that. Badly decayed today, this unique work of art was accepted by the Guinness Book of Records 
as the longest mural in the world. For many, Kong's work is a powerful symbol of man's capacity for rehabilitation. Well, when I think about Puri Jail, I think, I think the first thing that comes to mind uh, has always been the mural. Um, you know, I, I think it's been part of the, our visual landscape in KL for 30 years. And so it, at one time it was really very vibrant. It was very vivid because, you know, the, the whole mural was intact. It was, um, it was this amazing, um, you know, landscape of almost a fantasy. Well, I think the people who pass by will, also, will, you know, looking at them painting at that time would also just realize that they're humans too. Like everyone has talent, everyone has a purpose. And that way, that understanding is developed, you know, like um, they understand it better. The mural is fast becoming history. It's fading and peeling. The rest of the prison too is crumbling. Journalist Zan Asli has closely followed the story of Pudu's slow decay. Oh, don't demolish the jail, it's like our heritage and things like that. And they kind of stopped the construction workers. And the construction workers wanted to continue, but they couldn't because everybody was standing there. And it's like the construction workers were like, they're trying to get everybody away, but nobody wanted to get down. They were just hanging around. Some were taking pictures. A lot of people were taking bricks home as souvenirs. Even I took one of the bricks home. Zan passionately believes that Pudu should be preserved as a unique city landmark. For me, for example, Pudu Jail is older than me. Ever since I was born, Pudu Jail was already there. I, knew, I don't even remember when I, I realized that the existence of Pudu Jail is just there. You know? uh, so yeah, it's a part of everybody's lives. So when you talk about demolishing it, of course, you know, we feel sentimental, we feel a little bit emotional. But the problem is that no one knows precisely what to do with this relic. After being closed in 1999, the prison was briefly a museum. Few bothered to visit. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's a reminder, you know, it's a reminder uh, of the good or the bad that we, we have in the country. You know. But money usually speaks louder than sentiment. Situated close to the center of Kuala Lumpur's affluent Golden Triangle, the old prison stands on prime real estate ripe for development. The site has already been earmarked for the Bukit Bintang City Center, estimated to cost 1.6 billion US dollars. I read a lot of the stories in the internet saying that Pudu Jail is haunted, the land is haunted, everything is haunted there, you see, so it will not be an economic value or something. Even if you build high-rise buildings, the ghost will be up there, you see. So don't buy the condominium there, don't buy the shopping complex there, because the ghosts are all over. I don't think so. In June 2010, contractors moved in to start demolition, and most of the famous Pudu mural was torn down. It seems that complete destruction is inevitable, but some campaigners have suggested an ingenious compromise. I feel that uh, the front wall about say uh, 10 meters or 20 meters on each side of the main gate tower block should be preserved with the tower block. If that happens, the developers can have their lucrative land and Kuala Lumpur can still retain a potent symbol of its rich history. This was once the gate to hell, but sometimes the start of a new life. <laughs> For many, the monetary value of the land occupied by this forbidding old prison can never exceed its historical significance. But after 115 years, Pudu Jail is on death row. The executioner awaits. It is unlikely to be pardoned. No one regrets that Pudu Jail has been closed forever. But the people of Kuala Lumpur may, in time, come to miss its strange and haunting power and regret its passing.